Hello, everyone. This is John Girardi, and I'm the executive director over at Right to Life of Central California. The following is a video presentation, a talk that I'm trying to give to different groups, particularly uh, to nurses, uh, healthcare practitioners. I provided this for some of our staff at the Obrea Medical Clinics of Central California, which is our uh, subsidiary corporation at a right to life. And this talk is basically, it's generally called Facts About Abortion, but what it's trying to do is to explain to people pretty much how abortion is done. Uh, the different abortion procedures, the difference between abortion and certain things that are not in abortion that involve the deaths of unborn children, uh, and also really to kind of emphasize and explain the changing face of abortion provision, the changing nature of abortion provision in the United States of America today, uh, particularly highlighting the rise in popularity of pill abortion, uh, so-called medication abortion, the abortion pill. So I'm going to go through today basically explaining, giving some basic definitions uh, about the nature of abortion, the nature of different kinds of – how these different kinds of interventions are performed. Uh, before I begin, I just want to preface by saying uh, the point of this is not to morally shock anyone. There are no graphic images in this presentation, no graphic videos. Uh, I'm doing this for an audience that is largely already pro-life and just wants to understand the nature and reality, uh, the, the dangers – that the abortion pill, for example, poses to our children, the nature of how abortion is performed. So I, I have no videos, there's no graphic images, there's nothing to turn away from. The, the reality of how certain abortion procedures are done uh, can be very uh, a bit stark and shocking, but there's no, there are no videos or, or anything like that. So uh, to whatever extent you're comfortable with that, I encourage you to continue watching the video, and I really hope and think uh, you'll learn something from this presentation. So let's get started by giving definitions of things because I, I think that that needs to be fundamentally where we start. And the definition of abortion is something that is a little bit more complicated than I think a lot of pro-lifers realize, and it leads to a lot of talking past each other where pro-lifers and pro-choicers are sort of using the same words but meaning different things and sort of talking past each other. So. I found this definition of abortion that I think matches a little bit more with how most of us in society, when we talk about abortion, when pro-lifers talk about abortion, this is what most people think of uh, with abortion. Abortion is defined by the American Heritage Science Dictionary as the induced termination of pregnancy involving destruction of the embryo or fetus. And that word induced is really important. It means you have done something that brought the abortion about. You you uh, induce is from the Latin inducere to lead in. Uh, so you did something to make this abortion happen. Now the problem is that when medic in a medical context, very often the word abortion is used more broadly. It's used to refer to essentially any ending of a pregnancy, any termination of a pregnancy, whether it happened spontaneously or through some induced intervention, some artificial intervention. And sometimes in the medical context, you'll have under the, the big umbrella of abortion, you will have sort of two subcategories, induced abortion, which is what we think of as abortion, but also spontaneous abortion, which most of us would refer to as miscarriage, okay? This sort of ambiguity of language and different ways of using the same word abortion is being exploited by the pro-abortion side very often in public policy debates in ways that are confusing, in ways that have caused so much confusion that even uh, it's impacted how hospitals have conducted themselves. And the reason why I'm saying this is because, you know, we, we've seen a lot of examples of different kinds of interventions that are not classically induced abortions, not things that we in the pro-life movement would view as morally wrong abortions, which are getting this abortion label. And we pro-lifers are being made out to be sort of villains by people saying, how dare you outlaw this necessary medical procedure because you're seeking to outlaw abortion? So I'll, I'll kind of explain 
that difference there, but not every intervention, such as an ectopic pregnancy treatment, uh, such as a, a D and C procedure to remove the body of a child who has died in a miscarriage, not every procedure that involves a terminated pregnancy is the same as an induced abortion. And there's a lot of sort of talking past each other that's led to a lot of confusion. I'm going to explain all of that. So when I say abortion, I'm, I'm generally in this talk talking about induced abortion, a live, healthy baby who is killed, deliberately, intentionally killed with the, with the only sort of therapeutic goal of the intervention being the ending of the pregnancy. There are approximately 900,000 such abortions that take place in America every year. Almost one out of every four women in America will have had an abortion by age 45, and that's a really important point. Uh, the numbers are what they are, and that those numbers have, I think, really impacted me and my way of talking about the abortion issue uh, and having a kind of trauma-informed approach. Basically, no matter what, I any room you are in, if it has enough of a critical mass of people, it's almost statistically certain that there's a woman in that room who's had an abortion or a man who has been party to one. I don't care where you are. If you go to church on Sunday, you go to a baseball game, you go to a classroom, uh, if it has uh, you know, a, class, you know, a college classroom or something, maybe the older you get, the more likely, uh, almost any large gathering of people, there's someone in there who has had an abortion, who has dealt with abortion, and that needs to inform how we talk about this to talk with sensitivity, to talk with compassion, to offer love and forgiveness and mercy, as opposed to overly strident uh, condemnation. We can you know, be stridently opposed to abortion without being opposed to people, without hating people or failing to give people appropriate love and concern. Other terms that we should understand in the, course of, in the context of this uh, talk are definitions of the different stages of human development in the womb. So there's fetus. A fetus is a pre-born human being, um, eight weeks post-conception through birth. An embryo is a pre-born human being, two to eight weeks post-conception. And I'm using, uh, for all the dating uh, here, from last menstrual period. So conception might have taken place a little later, but last menstrual period is really the most common way of measuring the duration of a pregnancy. A normal pregnancy is 40 weeks from last menstrual period. Uh, that's the terminology most often used. A zygote is the first cell of a living human organism. When an egg cell and a sperm cell meet, they form a zygote, which is the first cell of a new human organism. Now, there, there are a number of pro-lifers who I've had pro-lifers get angry at me for talking about these topics and saying the words fetus and embryo. And there are a lot of pro-lifers who are sort of committed to this idea that calling an unborn child a fetus is somehow dehumanizing and you're just giving in to the left. Um, I, I must admit, I, I find this debate fairly tiresome. Uh, embryo and fetus are scientifically accurate words to describe different stages of human development, uh, just as, you know, we use phrases like newborn, uh, toddler, child, adolescent, adult, you know, geriatric. Like, we, we used... All these different words to describe different phases of human development. I don't think that makes you less of a human being by calling you an embryo or a fetus, um, especially if it's given in the context of literally a pro-life talk in which I'm t talking about the dignity and sanctity of all human life. Um, frankly, I I'm I'm not going to um, you know I I'm not going to apologize for saying fetus and embryo. We're talking about this in a scientific context, so I want to use scientifically accurate terms. So for the purposes of our talk, I think it's important to understand the terms fetus and embryo and understand the date ranges because different kinds of abortions could involve an embryo, it could involve a fetus, these are different stages of development, and it's kind of important to understand the terminology when other people are discussing it with us. So anyway, with that, let's move on. Now, one of the things that's really important for understanding certain kind of interventions that the pro-life community has recognized as being ethically correct and, and ethically acceptable versus abortion and understanding the distinction, one of the things that's important is to understand what health care means. And, and this is a really important point for a lot of debates that happen between the pro-life side and the pro-abortion side. 
uh, you have probably heard people on the pro-abortion side repeat the slogan, abortion is health care, abortion is health care, abortion is health care. Uh, I use this image. This image that I have in the slide here was taken from uh, a Democratic Party Twitter account that, where they were promoting this idea that abortion is health care. And you will hear from the pro-life side, likely, people repeating that abortion is not health care. And I think people can sometimes misunderstand the kind of what's going on with this argument. They, they might think, well, this is just two different ways of saying abortion is good or abortion is bad. If you say abortion is health care, that's another way of saying abortion is good. If you say abortion is not health care, that's your way of saying abortion is bad. And it's actually slightly different. So what is health care? Health care is defined, I went to Merriam-Webster, health care is defined as the maintaining and restoration of health by the treatment and prevention of disease, especially by trained and licensed professionals. So it's either maintaining your health or restoring your health once you've lost it, bringing you back to a state of health. Now, there are some kinds of interventions that are not healthcare. To illustrate that, let's go to the next slide here. Now, <laughs> I have here two, uh, two noses. The one is pre-plastic surgeries Michael Jackson, and the other is a random hockey player. I literally just did a Google search for you know hockey player broken nose. Uh, his name is Nathan McKinnon. He plays for the Colorado Avalanche. Okay. Now, if Michael Jackson and Nathan McKinnon both go to a plastic surgeon's office and they both ask for a nasal reconstructive surgery, is that health care? Well, for Michael Jackson... It probably isn't. There's nothing wrong with Michael Jackson's nose. His nose is perfectly healthy. It is in a state of health. What you're doing is not preventing any future, you know, ailments to his nose or fixing anything that's wrong with his nose. You're just changing his nose for aesthetic reasons. If anything, you're, you're probably harming his nose, which is indeed what happened. Michael Jackson's nose, by the time he died, it was like practically, it was falling apart because he had, had so many uh, nasal reconstructive surgeries. Now, with our poor hockey uh, friend on the right there, uh, yeah, that would be healthcare. His nose is in a state of ill health, to say the least, okay? This, now, this is the most gruesome image uh, from the entire uh, presentation. Uh, his nose is in a bad state. It's, it's going the wrong direction. So to fix his nose is health care. And, and that illustrates what I'm talking about. Just because something is done by a doctor or could have health care side effects or, or requires health care practitioners to do it, that doesn't mean that the intervention itself is health care. Now, as we go back to the prior slide, the, that is sort of showing us what the stakes are in this debate. So ask yourself, if abortion is health care, what illness or condition is it treating? What illness is it healing? Pregnancy? Pregnancy is not a disease. Pregnancy is a natural bodily function, a natural bodily state. Uh, abortion is not healing it. It's not treating it. It's not preventing some future problem. It's just ending a pregnancy artificially. So I think that is rightly why abortion, we on the side of life, we would say that abortion is not healthcare because, and not necessarily even from a polemical standpoint, we're just saying it's not addressing a healthcare problem. The overwhelming majority of cases, abortion is chosen not because someone has some kind of health care problem that abortion is al allegedly purporting to fix. So if abortion is health care, that has huge consequences. If it, Whether it is or is not can have huge consequences in a variety of ways. First is insurance. You know, if you go back to, you know, Michael Jackson versus the hockey guy, uh, insurance is going to cover you know, the nasal reconstructive surgery for the hockey player. It's far more likely to cover that than it is for Michael Jackson. Why? Because Michael Jackson's thing is elective. He's choosing it for a non-health related reason. It's not actually something that he needs to do to preserve his health. And not only for private insurance, but for public insurance. Okay, we have to make decisions as a society 
that pays taxes to fund government-funded health insurance programs like Medicare, like Medicaid, or it's California version, Medi-Cal, what kinds of things are these government-run health care plans, what kinds of things are they going to cover? What kinds of things are they going to treat? What kinds of things should the government mandate that health insurance companies cover as part of basic health care? So for insurance, for public funding, and for anti-discrimination methods, uh, for anti-discrimination questions. Okay, if, if you're a health insurance company, but you're like, sorry, we're not going to cover... You know, uh, we're not going to cover breast exams. Uh, we're not going to cover mammograms. Well, that, that, that's a basic act of health care. It's a, an intervention designed to prevent more serious onset of breast cancer. Uh, if you just say, we're going to refuse that, well, people can sort of raise the question, are, are you just discriminating against women? This is, this is basic health care. This is basic women's health care. Why would you not want to provide coverage for you know, breast cancer exams or uh, well woman exams or other kinds of gynecological care seems kind of discriminatory. So the status of abortion as healthcare versus not as healthcare is really important. It's also really important for understanding what kinds of things are abortion versus what kinds of things are not abortion. Most kinds of things that are something separate from abortion actually have a healthcare directed end goal. And that's really critical. So as we go to the next uh, slide here, two down. So this allows us to understand things that are not induced abortions, not normal induced abortions. The point of an induced abortion is directly to end a pregnancy by killing the embryo or the fetus. That's the chief therapeutic goal for, an in, for most induced abortions. Now, the following things have actual therapeutic end goals because, again, as we're saying, pregnancy is not a disease. There's nothing therapeutic or re restoring of health care by terminating a pregnancy. So some of the things that are, are actually therapeutic that might involve the death of a fetus are things like ectopic pregnancy treatment. So the embryo is growing in the wrong place. Uh, it's growing in the fallopian tube rather than the uterus. This can lead to serious uh, health risks to mom. To remove a baby in that situation is addressing a very serious health care risk. Uh, certain kinds of procedures to remove the body of an unborn child, a fetus or an embryo, who has died in the womb. So some of these procedures, a DNC, a dilation and curatage, or a DNE, a dilation and extraction, these are used as abortion procedures, but you can also use them to remove the body of an unborn child who has died in the womb through a miscarriage, a spontaneous abortion, if you will. See how this terminology works. So there has been confusion happening uh, between, for, for certain hospitals to say, well, can we do a... A DNC after a miscarriage, after the state, after you know, after Roe v. Wade's overturned, this state has outlawed abortion. Can we do a DNC uh, to remove the body of this miscarried fetus? Well, uh, of course you can. There's a, obviously a clear fundamental difference between an induced abortion where you end the life of a living human fetus or embryo as opposed to a procedure to remove the already deceased body of that fetus and embryo because, and that has a real healthcare goal to it. If you leave the body of a fetus or embryo in the woman's uterus, there is all kinds of risk of infection and all kinds of risk of serious health problems. You're addressing a real health risk. You're preventing uh, serious health complications from going forward. Preterm delivery to treat different kinds of conditions. This is another thing that we in the pro-life community would not classify as abortion even if there's a higher chance that the child will die. So for various kinds of conditions, preeclampsia, high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, maybe in certain kinds of cancers, there are situations where to save the mother's life, the baby needs to be out of the mother. So the two ways of doing that are either through abortion or through premature delivery. Now, with preterm delivery, you're not directly doing something to kill the child, you foresee that there's a greater risk to the child. You're trying, going to try to do everything you can to preserve the child's life. But you recognize there's a chance that the child will die. That is something different from direct abortion to deliberately do something to end the life of the child. There's a therapeutic goal to what you're doing. 
Lastly, you can look at treatments for other kinds of conditions that could jeopardize the embryo or fetus's health. For example, chemotherapy uh, for a pregnant cancer patient. But again, that is something much different from directly killing the unborn child. you trying to weigh pros and cons, weigh risk and reward. A woman has cancer. If she gets chemo, that could threaten the baby. That's something very different from a direct chosen induced abortion where the only point of the intervention is the death of the child. Now, uh, the problem of characterizing certain things that are not really traditionally thought of as abortion uh, is so widespread. There are a number of stories. This has been very widespread in the media. And I think the goal has been let's characterize the pro-life side as a bunch of wackos denying women essential basic health care services. So this was an article from everydayhealth.com which published a list of female celebrities speaking out on their abortion experiences and saying how terrible it is after the overturning of Roe v. Wade in 2022, that how terrible it is uh, that different states are outlying abortions because I needed an abortion and this is my story. And you had stories of women who genuinely did not have what we traditionally think of as induced abortions, things that we would view to be morally wrong. Uh, Lauren Conrad is a former formerly was on a very popular reality show called The Hills. And the article talked, profiled her, the fact that she had an ectopic pregnancy and had a treatment to re remove the child from the ectopic pregnancy situation. That is something very distinct and different from an abortion. Uh, Debbie Reynolds was highlighted for this. Carrie Fisher's mom, who was herself a very famous, prominent actress. Uh, Debbie Reynolds complained, it's so terrible that they're outlawing abortions. Uh, when I had my two miscarriages, I needed an abortion, and it was so difficult to get. Well, again, she had a miscarriage and then needed a procedure, presumably a DNC or a DNE, to remove the bodies of her children who had died during the miscarriage. That is something very different from induced abortion. A and we commonly see that because sometimes... And again, like nobody in the pro-life community wants to ban a DNC or a DNE after a child has died via miscarriage. Nobody wants to ban that. No one wants to restrict that. None of the state laws on the books limiting abortion have done so. So this confusion, I think, is being exploited by the pro-abortion side. All right, so now we get to the actual methods of how abortion is performed and there are sort of two major headings for how abortion is performed. There is so-called medication or pill abortion, and that is distinct from surgical abortion. So medicine and surgery are kind of the two big uh, divisions of how healthcare is provided. Medication abortion is the abortion pill, mifepristone or mifeprex. Surgical abortion is what I think is most commonly what most people think of when they think of abortion and was the dominant way of performing abortions, less so today. Surgical abortion is divided into uh, first trimester dilation and curatage abortion, second trimester dilation and extraction, and then late term induction abortion. And we'll, we'll touch on all of those uh, uh, in the course of this presentation. So let's start with uh, the abortion pill. And this is really, I think, one of the most important part of this presentation is to explain the abortion pill. Because I think most people still think of abortion as largely a surgical phenomenon. You go in, you have an abortion. And the abortion pill has skyrocketed in popularity, particularly over the last decade. Uh, and a lot of it had to do with how the abortion pill got deregulated, if you will, by the Obama administration, FDA. So the abortion pill, uh, let, let's talk about the terminology here. Uh, it's usually called medication abortion. That's the commonly used name. I quibble with that because, again, it's kind of like calling abortion healthcare. If the abortion pill is medication, then what is it medicating? What, what disease is it treating? Again, pregnancy is not a disease. Uh, so now, however, medication abortion is the way that most people talk about it. If you need to have people understand what you're talking about, if you're talking with a pro-choice person or someone not in the pro-life movement, saying medication abortion makes clear what you mean. Uh, you can also, though, call it pill abortion. Uh, the abortion pill can be is is uh, not the morning after pill, and this is such an important point. The abortion pill is not 
the morning after pill. This is such an important point. Most people, when you say the abortion pill, they think you mean the morning after pill. The morning after pill, otherwise known as plan B, is taken, as the name implies, the morning after a sexual encounter that someone does not want to have result in a baby. And uh, it chiefly functions genuinely as a contraceptive. It kind of has a backup mechanism that maybe that could be in certain circumstances abortifacient, but its chief mechanism is preventing ovulation, preventing conception from happening. The abortion pill is different. This is an intervention by ingesting pills up to five to 10 weeks into pregnancy after the embryo or fetus is already developed. It is basically designed to bring about an artificial miscarriage. So it's a much more drastic intervention than plan B as far as the impact on the woman's body, uh, as far as the, the, the certitude that it's going to result in a genuine abortion as opposed to plan B where uh, basically plan B has a backup mechanism to sort of prevent the fertilized egg, the, the embryo from adhering to the uterine wall. Um, the abortion pill is deliberately designed. It's, its chief goal is terminating the life of a human being that has definitely formed. In the abortion pill process, you take two medications over the course of 24 to 48 hours. There's mifepristone, which is also known as mifeprex, which is the brand name. And that is the abortion pill proper, or RU486 was its original sort of terminology for it. Misoprostol is then taken 24 to 48 hours later uh, to induce labor and basically to expel the body of the baby from the woman's, from the woman's body. Um, misoprostol is also used in legitimate contexts uh, to help induce labor. And again, I, I think the thing I want to sort of emphasize to everybody is how common this method of abortion is. 53% of all abortions in the United States are now done via the abortion pill. So uh, it, that is, when, so when you think about abortion, this is what you should think of for the most part, not I go in and I have a surgical abortion. That, that was abortion as it existed in the 90s, in the 2000s. The abortion pill is the most common way that abortions are performed in the United States today. So how does it work? Mifepristone, the first drug, blocks the body's production of progesterone, which is produced by mom to nourish and sustain a pregnancy. It alters the lining of the uterus to cut off blood and nourishment to the baby so the baby can't continue adhering to the uterine wall. Baby loses uh, food, oxygen, blood. Baby then dies. Misoprostol is taken 24 to 48 hours. It's ingested orally or vaginally, and it causes contractions and bleeding to expel the baby. So what we're talking about here is you're basically artificially recreating a miscarriage. That, that's what the abortion pill is. It is not a sort of... It, it is a pretty drastic healthcare intervention. That, that's a, the main point I want to push because so often the pro-abortion side tries to characterize it as, oh, it's, it's safer than taking a Tylenol. And they, they sort of downplay the enormity, the, the extent of what a drastic healthcare intervention this is. It's not like taking a Tylenol, okay? It, it, it can involve heavy bleeding, heavy cramping, and a lot of risks of serious blood loss and all kinds of things, which we'll talk about more. The abortion pill process also takes place with very limited medical supervision uh, because of the ways in which it was deregulated. So you should have an in-clinic prior exam or ultrasound, but you don't have to nowadays. Uh, the first pill can be taken in clinic, although nowadays it can be also just taken at home. The second pill and the subsequent expelling of the fetus, that almost always just takes place at home, all right, either in your bathroom, and it is also possible that you can see the baby. Uh, you can see the fetus when it is expelled. That is, that is possible. It's small, but it is possible, and women have reported seeing their fetus after uh, a pill abortion process. One should have a follow-up afterwards for reasons we'll explain, but that does not always happen. And again, this is because abortion pill by mail has become a new sort of protocol that has been adopted, allowed by the FDA uh, in recent years. Now, because the chief way that mifepristone, the abortion pill, works is to 
block progesterone, the abortion pill reversal process is basically to give a woman a heavy dosage of progesterone to counteract what mifepristone does. Um, and uh, a number of different pro-life uh, healthcare providers do provide abortion pill reversal in Fresno. Uh, both the Obrea Medical Clinics of Central California and Pregnancy Care Center do offer abortion pill reversal. Now, uh, I want to talk about the dangers of pill abortion and, and to explain to you why and how um, the abortion pill became so prominent. It became prominent because of how it was deregulated. Now, the FDA first ap approved the abortion pill in the year 2000. And this was in the waning months of the Clinton administration. So the Clinton administration worked like busy beavers for essentially eight solid years to get the abortion pill brought over to America from Europe and to get it FDA approved. And in the last year of the Clinton administration, when it was very dicey as to whether Al Gore or George W. Bush was going to win the November 2000 election, in September, the FDA approved the abortion pill through an expedited process that was reserved for medications that treat serious diseases. Now, a lot of people have now raised the question of, was that legal? Because again, abortion, the abortion pill doesn't treat a serious disease. So actually, there's a lawsuit ongoing right now about whether that original FDA approval was legal. In 2016, in the last year of the Obama administration, so note, uh, Clinton administration worked like busy beavers for eight years to get the abortion approval pill approved. The George W. Bush administration did nothing for eight years to roll back that approval. And then in the last year of the Obama administration, the FDA loosened restrictions on the abortion pill. So when the abortion pill was first approved, because it was, it was very controversial at its approval, there were a whole bunch of basically safety protocols around it. Uh, you couldn't prescribe it after seven weeks. Of, the FDA guidelines were only through the first seven weeks of pregnancy. Uh, you could only have it prescribed after three doctor visits in clinic. Um, there, was, there were all kinds of different safety protocols on it. In spite of that, there was evidence developed of thousands of women suffering hemorrhaging, uh, thousands of women who had to be hospitalized, uh, passing blood clots, infections, and several women who died. Uh, to this day, about 28 women have died from the abortion pill. In 2016, though, the FDA, and again, this the last year of the Obama administration. Is Hillary going to get elected president? Is Donald Trump going to get elected president? We're not sure, so let's pass regulation in the last year of the Obama administration. Uh, the FDA loosened restrictions on the abortion pill, allowing it to be taken up to 10 weeks into pregnancy, up from seven. They cease to mandate collecting any adverse health outcomes other than death, and they reduce the three-doctor visit to a one-doctor visit. So that makes the abortion pill much more readily obtainable. And this is where you start to see the number of pill abortions begin to really rise in America. Now, in 2021, the first year of the Biden administration, so again, another four years of a different Republican administration not doing anything to roll this back. In 2021, the first year of the Biden administration, the FDA began to allow abortion pills to be shipped to patients through the mail and to get rid of the requirement for the one inpatient visit. So usually what would happen is the patient would have to be seen in uh, the, the one, excuse me, in clinic visit. So usually the patient would have to be seen once by a doctor in clinic, and that's where the first abortion pill would be given and ingested. Well, the Biden administration didn't want that. And many in the abortion public policy community, they were emphasizing, we want abortion to be universally accessible and requiring women to drive to an abortion clinic limits accessibility. So what do they want? They want this to be the abortion clinic of the future. Uh, a woman can get a telemedicine app, start chatting with a nurse practitioner, have a telemedicine visit, a no-touch telemedicine visit, which protocols were developed to allow for that, a no-touch telemedicine visit uh, to allow a doc or a nurse practitioner to prescribe a pill abortion over the phone, and then for the abortion pill to be mailed to the patient's house or to be picked up at a major American pharmacy. Now, these changes happened in 2021 and 2022 during the Biden administration, and we, I, I think this is further making the abortion pill more readily accessible. Now, this is leading to all kinds of big risks. If you don't have an inpatient visit 
an, an in-clinic visit prior to the abortion pill, you're not getting an ultrasound. And what does that mean? Well, you could miss the fact that a woman might be experiencing an ectopic pregnancy, which can be life-threatening for the woman. The abortion pill is not going to work if the baby's growing in the fallopian tube rather than the uterus. And if the baby keeps growing in the fallopian tube, that woman could die. Uh, there was an article in the New England Journal of Medicine in January of 2023 detailing a case where this precise thing happened. A woman tried to have a self-managed abortion uh, with the abortion pill, and nobody caught that she was having an ectopic pregnancy. If you don't have a follow-up visit afterwards, you could miss the fact that you've had an incomplete abortion. Not everything was expelled from the woman's uterus, which can lead to real serious risk of infection. Uh, the other huge problem with the abortion pill, and this is a, a clipping on the right here, I have a clipping from a news story talking about this, abortion pills are so portable and so readily accessible that basically there's a massive illegal market for the abortion pill. Uh, abortion advocates have talked about, either openly or covertly uh, in some cases, uh, the idea of importing abortion pills to states that now have passed legal limits on abortion. Uh, there is... All, there are also illegal websites where people without a prescription can order abortion pills uh, from China or India. So the abortion pill is has really just opened a Pandora's box of really dangerous consequences. Now, uh, the risks and effects of chemical abortion, of the pill abortion pill, uh, can be quite serious. 98 out of 100 women experience a serious abdominal pain, 2 in 5 experience nausea, one in five experience vomiting, there's diarrhea, serious headache, excessive bleeding, one out of every 12 women. Bleeding can last on average nine to 16 days. 8% of women experience bleeding for more than 30 days. 1% of women require hospitalization after a pill abortion. And this is really a critical thing. Five to 8% of women may need a surgical procedure to complete the abortion or to stop excess bleeding, meaning not everything was expelled from the woman's body, leading to serious risk of infection. So the abortion pill is not some light, simple, easy procedure, and that is very much how the abortion industry is marketing it. Um, and the way that it has been so deregulated by the Biden administration, including since 2016 with the Obama administration, you know, all these stats we have, these were collected pre-2016, after 2016, the FDA stopped collecting any adverse data on the abortion pill other than death. That was one of the regulations enacted in 2016, was to not collect any more of this information. And furthermore, there we have anecdotal evidence of patients being told by doctors, hey, if you have to go to the ER afterwards, don't tell them that this was a pill abortion. Uh, we have anecdotal evidence of women just feeling uh, either a sense of remorse or regret or shame, not telling the person at the ER that, they had gone through the abortion pill process, just saying, you know, maybe maybe just saying that they miscarried or something. So even these statistics, I think, are only the tip of the iceberg for how bad, how dangerous the abortion pill genuinely is. Now, let's we're going to get into the different surgical abortion procedures. Um, the first is the most common surgical abortion procedure, which used to be the most common method of abortion, period, uh, which is the DNC, the dilation and curatage abortion. This is performed in clinic five to 13 weeks since a woman's last menstrual period. It involves an exam in advance, including an ultrasound. Uh, it requires metal rods or medication to be used to dilate the woman's cervix in order to gain access to it. During this procedure, a suction catheter, which is shown here in this image, uh, this image was provided by Live Action. Uh, a suction catheter is used to vacuum the fetus to vacuum the amniotic fluid and the fetus itself out of the womb. Now, th this is a very late in the window. This image, I think, is showing a very late stage uh, DNC ab abortion. Uh, this is likely an actual a fetus. Uh, this can be done during the stage when the unborn child is still an embryo. Um, so, during this process, the embryo is sucked out of the mother's womb through this uh, catheter instrument. After that is done, the doctor uses a, cur a curette to scrape the lining of the uterus and ensure that the child's, that the child's bodily remains and any other tissue, uh, like the placenta, is removed from the mother's uterus. Uh, a follow-up exam and ultrasound can be performed to minimize the risk of incomplete abortion. 
Now, this is an important point. Remember what I was saying, that the difference between a DNC to treat a mis you know, things that are and are not abortions. This procedure, while we believe when it is done, performed on a live embryo or fetus is a morally very seriously wrong act. It is an act of abortion. This same procedure, though, can be done in a legitimate context to care for a woman who has suffered a miscarriage. Uh, a woman has suffered a miscarriage. They need to remove the body of the unborn child from her uterus. Otherwise, she's going to suffer very serious. She could suffer very serious infection and other healthcare consequences. So this is a legitimate procedure to help treat someone who's experienced miscarriage. Uh, one of the the Duggar family, I don't know how, how many people saw that reality show. This was a reality show about a family that had like 19 kids. Uh, one of the adult daughters who was married um, ha suffered a miscarriage and received a DNC treatment. And this was reported in the media and people were sort of blasting her and saying, oh, she opposes legal abortion from everyone else. But when she needs an abortion, then that's okay. Well, again, this is different from an induced abortion. She suffered a spontaneous abortion and had a treatment to remove the body of the unborn child. That is completely different, distinct, ethically, every which way from an induced abortion. To this day, approximately 40% of all abortions are performed through this method. So the abortion pill is the most popular, and we're kind of going in order of descending popularity here. So most abortions, over 90% of abortions are done via the abortion pill or through uh, a DNC. Uh, the DNC abortion procedure has a lot, uh, several different risks and adverse effects. It, it pr has l fewer risks, though, than any of the next two procedures. So uh, with a DNC abortion, it actually avoids some of the risks of the abortion pill because you have to bring the woman into the clinic to do it. You have to do an ultrasound first before you do it. There, there's more oversight. So I think there's less of a risk of an incomplete abortion. There's less of a risk of missing an ectopic pregnancy. Um, however, there are some risks uh, to a DNC abortion. The risk of damage to the uterus or cervix, damage to the intestines, bladder, and nearby blood vessels, risk of hemorrhage, infection, and in rare cases, death. Uh, there's some risk of an incomplete abortion. Uh, now, basically, any of these abortion procedures can involve some trauma to the cervix. And if there is trauma to the cervix, that can make it more likely that a woman will experience a miscarriage in subsequent pregnancies. So that kind of risk of trauma to the cervix will increase in later and later uh, stages of abortion. Now we're going to talk about uh, second trimester abortions. Uh, often the pro-abortion community tries to deny that late-term abortions happen. Uh, late-term abortion is, is not necessarily a medical term. It's something that pro-lifers use to refer to abortions that happen really late in pregnancy. Um, this is maybe the most difficult, in some ways, maybe the most difficult of all abortion procedures to kind of talk about because it, the nature of the procedure is just kind of inherently violent. So uh, my apologies, but this is uh, sort of what it involves. Uh, a dilation and evacuation abortion. So in this procedure, uh, the child is 13 to 24 weeks from last menstrual period. We're 13 to 24 weeks into pregnancy. Uh, the child is too large to extract uh, in a DNC procedure. So uh, basically a DNE abortion involves removing the child manually, uh, re removing the child physically from the woman's uterus, not through a suction curette, not through a, a suction device, but with uh, basically to piece by piece remove the child from the woman's body. So to prepare the woman's body, laminaria are inserted, which is a medical sterilized seaweed to open the cervix 24 to 48 hours prior to the procedure. Local anesthesia is given and metal dilators and specula uh, are, can be used to widen the cervix. Um, the procedure itself involves uh, a suction catheter, the same suction catheter that would be used in a DNC abortion, is used to drain the amniotic fluid. Sofer clamps are used to grasp and pull the fetus body parts out. Uh, Sofer clamps kind of like a, it's a sort of grasping instrument. Uh, it's uh, basically a stainless steel instrument 
with sort of clamping, almost like forceps, sort of a clamp at the end of it with sort of ridged metal teeth that's used to grasp uh, the different body parts and extract them, uh, the limbs, piece by piece. The fetus skull is crushed uh, in this process and removed. Uh, the curette is then used to scrape the uterus, the lining of the uterus, including the placenta and any remaining tissue. Uh, the body of the fetus has to be collected and sort of roughly reassembled uh, on the table in order to ensure that all major limbs and body parts are accounted for and have been removed. Now, uh, the d and &E is obviously a very drastic uh, surgical intervention, and it has more risks than uh, a DNC abortion does. Uh, there's greater risk of perforated or lacerated uterus or cervix uh, because now you're dealing with bones and broken bones uh, that are being removed. There's potential damage to the bowel, bladder, rectum, or other maternal organs. There's risk of excess bleeding or hemorrhaging. Uh, from removing the placenta, which is more tightly adhered to the uterine wall at this stage of pregnancy. Um, there's also a greater risk of that as you go later on into pregnancy. Long-term, uh, there's more frequent long-term risks than for first trimester abortions um, and greater risk of subsequent miscarriage because there's more of a risk of trauma uh, to the cervix. Now, uh, a lot of times this method of abortion is sort of downplayed by the pro-abortion the pro-abortion side i think they inherently recognize that this is a very um very uh, brutal method of performing abortion uh with fetuses who are in many cases they are old enough to uh experience pain uh according to some studies and surveys these are fetuses that can feel experience pain um and so they try to minimize the number of such abortions. Approximately 5.8% of all American abortions are performed via d &E. and And um, that sounds like a small number, but when you think about the context of 900,000 abortions per year, uh, it's actually quite a few. So, uh, you know, almost, you know, over 50,000 uh, abortions that are performed via this method every year. So um, that is uh, anyway th that is i think a, a really serious and extremely uh, difficult uh healthcare intervention uh, it, it, not healthcare intervention uh intervention and it's something that we kind of need to understand how often this happens the last is uh late term induction abortion this happens very rarely less than 1% of all abortions uh it's performed at 25 weeks from the last menstrual period onward it is legal in California for pregnancies that threaten maternal health, uh, but this is under a very broad definition of health. Uh, California, basically, almost any unwanted pregnancy will be deemed to affect maternal health in order to justify uh, a late-term induction abortion. So the process with an induction abortion is, is, takes a very long time. Uh, it can take up to three or four days. Basically, the idea is to uh, prepare the woman to go into la labor, kill the baby first, prior to labor, to kill the baby, uh, and then to deliver a whole deceased baby. So on day one, there's an initial ultrasound, and the baby is injected with digoxin, or potassium chloride. This is to deliberately cause a fatal cardiac arrest uh, for the baby to ensure that the baby is not delivered alive. Um, the woman might be provided with laminaria to start dilating her cervix. Second ultrasound happens on day two to ensure that the child has died. Other labor-inducing drugs may be provided. And then on day three or day four, the woman returns to the clinic for labor to deliver uh, the fetus's body. And if that's not completed, uh, a D and E can still be performed to remove the baby's body. There's a high risk of hemorrhage, lacerations, uterine perforations. This just gets more and more dangerous uh, the later on into pregnancy it goes. Risk to future pregnancies from abortion-related trauma and injury uh, to the cervix. So with that, that kind of concludes the presentation. And again, the point of this was to help people understand what actually is happening in abortion. Uh, again, I, I tried throughout this not to sort of morally shock people or, or engage in shock value. Um, I, I just want to kind of give people the truth, to give people the understanding about what the difference is between abortion and things that are not abortion, 
and um, to kind of understand how, in particular, the abortion pill has become so prevalent uh, in society. So uh, with that, I thank you very much for listening to this presentation. This has been a presentation by Right to Life of Central California, rtlcc.org. If you want more information and citations uh, for different statistics, you can get in touch with us, and we'd be happy to provide those. Uh, Thank you all so much, and God bless.